And now for our main program, I'm pleased to bring to the podium our Seattle number four member, Carolyn Ladd, to introduce our main speaker. For those of you who have not met Carolyn as yet, she's an accomplished attorney who started her law career working both at Lane Powell and then Jackson Lewis in the Seattle area. Some of her specialty areas include labor law and employment law. For over two decades, she served as senior counsel for the Boeing Company and is currently judge pro tempore for both Kitsap County District Court and the Seattle Municipal Court. And as if that's not enough, she's currently got her hat in the ring as a judge candidate for King County Superior Court Department Number 30. Check your voter's guide this November for more information. Carolyn, over to you. Thank you very much. I am very pleased today to be able to introduce to you to my husband. Um, this is James Williams. Uh, we are newlyweds. We were married in June of this year. Uh, we had been friends for 20 years before that, and he has forbidden me from telling you the story about how I asked him out 10 years ago, and he said no. So I'm not going to tell that story. Right. <laughs> um, he, is, oh <laughs> he is the managing partner of Perkins Cooey, which is the largest law firm in Seattle. Uh, he grew up in rural South Carolina, and he'll tell you a little bit about that today. He went to college at the Citadel and then went to law school at the University of Virginia. He is the father of a 19-year-old daughter who just started herself at the University of Virginia. Uh, he served in the Air Force as a Judge Advocate General for four and a half years uh, before entering private practice. Uh, he is very committed to and involved in the community. He serves as the elected state delegate uh, for Washington State to the American Bar Association. Uh, he also helped found the Washington Leadership Institute, which is an annual program for lawyers uh, starting out from underserved and underrepresented communities that helps to give those lawyers uh, leadership opportunities, mentorship opportunities. And he just joined the board of the Urban League. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to move off camera and uh, James Williams. Don't move. Good afternoon, Rotary Club number four. It is such an honor for me to be here with you today. I want to thank my wonderful wife for that very generous introduction with the exception of the part about <laughs> us uh, not dating for 10 years. Uh, I don't know how that came up. And I also want to start with a special shout out to some friends of mine who I see in the audience and I'm delighted to have out there. Uh, these are outstanding Rotarians and uh, outstanding people. Jan Levy, Levy, who I've known for so many years, uh, from Leadership Tomorrow, John Bridge, Karen Lee, who I've known for almost 40 years, uh, Amy McKenna, and uh, the great Faith Ireland. So uh, you have a great rotary and you have great members, and um, it's a pleasure for me to be with you here today. I came here today to talk about race, and I want to talk about it in the context of what I, as an African-American male, think thinks that every uh, white person should know about African-Americans. And to be specific, when I'm talking about African-Americans, I'm talking about people who are descendants from slaves, because that's the point of reference that I have and that we're going to talk about in a minute. My goal today is that everyone on this call leave learning at least one new thing they did not know. And if that happens, I will be delighted. And I want you to come to see me at some point in the near future or far future to say, you know, James, I was at that presentation. Here's the one thing I took away from that conversation. And uh, if that happens, as I said, I will be delighted. Let's talk about the agenda for today. If I can get this to move. Aha. We're going to spend some time talking about how African Americans differ from any other racial or ethnic group. Um, we're going to then shift gears and talk about the things that I think are the 10 most significant historical events that have happened that uh, directly impact African Americans because they were so transformational. Obviously, one of those things is the George Floyd murder, but I have a view that there are silver linings from that that we should latch on to and focus on. And finally, I'm going gonna, gonna to finish uh, with a discussion of what white people should be doing, only because I get asked that question all the time. What should I, as a white person, be doing in order to advance the issue of racial equality in America? And then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions. All right, so why don't we start with a personal story from slavery to Seattle. 
it goes back to my lovely wife. When we were dating, she said, you know, why don't we do your genealogy? I said, no. And then she surreptitiously got some information from my mother. <laughs> she found out some uh, death certificates. She did some research on the census. And uh, lo and behold, she confirmed that I am a descendant of slaves on both sides, on my mother's side and on my father's side. My family has been in the United States apparently from since the late 1700s. And my family has generally been located in South Carolina doing agricultural work. Uh, and we have gone through the generations to uh, go through the Civil War, to uh, be first in line to enroll to vote when the federal troops came through South Carolina to allow that to happen, to enroll to serve our country in World War I and to give our uh, measure, our full measure for the country in that regard and other things. So uh, that was an eye-opening experience. And then she said, but there's more. Why don't we see what your DNA makeup is? And I said, Ugh. okay, we'll do that. So we did Ancestry.com and I was blown away because it came back saying, believe it or not, that I am 28% Caucasian. I know, stunner. The person you're looking at is part Norwegian, part Irish, part Scottish, part Welsh, part British, part Portuguese. And then the rest of it is a smattering of African-American countries such as Ivory Coast, Benin, Nigeria, uh, and on and on. Uh, 11 total countries make up my background, which uh, gets to my first point that I wanna bring to your attention that's to why we're unique. And when I heard this initially, I said to my wife, wow, this makes me really special. I've got 11 basic countries involved, I'm part white, and she said, you know, you're great, but you're not that special. Here's why, point number one, all African-Americans, newsflash James, have part white European blood and part black African blood, and the average is actually about 20%. 20% of most African-Americans are European in their bloodline. What does that mean? It means that we are as close to your cousins as you might find anywhere in the general population. We are truly all in this together and essentially related because of the slave trade. The second thing that makes us unique is that we African-Americans are all involuntary immigrants. When you think about it, we're the only racial or ethnic group that has ever been enslaved, captured, et cetera, and brought and sold, brought and sold in the United States with the blessing of the United States of America. You will see that actually in the text of the Constitution that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. And the last thing is, we African-Americans, we don't have any other country of origin. And I say that uh, to compare that with our white um, European brothers and sisters who often are able to say with great pride, oh, my great-great-grandfather came from Germany, or he came from Russia, or she came from Spain, or she came from here or there. We unfortunately don't have that luxury. As I mentioned in my own background, I have 11 different countries, so I don't think I could pick one as a point of origin. The flip side of that is we African-Americans have only one country of allegiance and only one place we look to as home. We are uniquely American because of the history that sur surrounds the slave trade. All right, now I wanna shift gears and talk a little bit about history as it relates to African-Americans. And I wanna talk in the context of those things that were transformational along the way for us uh, as a racial group. Now, if you know the answer to the, to the question, I'm gonna first put up the date of an event and the place of an event. You can send it in the chat. I may be able to look at it or Carolyn can look at it. If not, I'm gonna tease you for a second with it and then move on and tell you what I want to share. So first event, this is Jamestown, Virginia. The year is 1619. And if you're guessing that this is the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, you are absolutely on the money. This is actually an eyewitness account from a guy named John Rolfe, who apparently was the husband of Pocahontas. He actually observed, according to legend, or actually according to text, the Dutch man of war ship come into the harbor and unload nothing but 20 odd Negroes. Translation of this old English, ship was off course, they were trying to figure out how to get resupplies. The only thing they had to trade was 20 slaves in their cargo. They traded those slaves for, for supplies to go on their merry way. And they started the transatlantic slave trade because those slaves were so productive agriculturally for the colonists there in Jamestown 
that the use of slaves spread exponentially throughout the colonies. And it was not just in the South, it was also in the North. This particular picture I used to illustrate the point of who benefited from the slave trade. It is not all white Europeans. Here's why. What you see are Africans, all Africans, but there are two classes. You've got the captors and you've got the slaves. The captors were also complicit with the slave trade and made lots of money from the selling of human flesh in the form of these African, African slaves. The only people who did not get anything out of this whole thing are these people, the slaves, who unfortunately were my ancestors. Event number two. This one might be a bit more obscure. Most people don't know about it. I will give you a hint. It relates to the Constitution of the United States and one of our founding fathers. And I will tell you, it relates to Thomas Jefferson signing an act officially prohibiting the importation of any more slaves into the United States, effective the first day of January in 1808. That's odd. It's really odd because why 1808? When I saw this, what is the point of doing that? Well, here's why. He was conforming with what the Constitution said. In Article 1, Section 9, it says migration or importation of such persons, they're talking about slaves there, shall not be prohibited by Congress until 1808. That is written into our U.S. Constitution. Translation? This was a great compromise by the founding fathers at the very beginning of this nation. They said, in order to appease the Southern delegates who really wanted to keep slave trade going, we'll give them a 20-year moratorium to continue this international trade by bringing African slaves into the United States. In January 1, 1808 was literally the earliest date allowed in our Constitution for the banning of the transatlantic slave trade. And this ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what it was banning. What you see here is a drawing. This is the hull of a slave ship. This is what it looked like in the 1800s when Africans were being brought from Africa to the United States in chains in the hull of these ships. And obviously my ancestors came to this country via this route. Now, when Jefferson signed this ban on the importation of new Africans from abroad, he did not end the domestic slave trade. As a matter of fact, it accelerated internally in the United States. And you saw the um, creation of what was called breeding farms for African slaves. They actually started to breed humans, Africans, to be slaves sold internally to the colonies and then to uh, the other states. And Virginia was one of the biggest um, sellers, transporters, of African-American slaves at that time. Event number three. And the reason why number two is important is because that literally ended the transatlantic um, importation of slaves, even though it didn't end the slave trade practice. Number three is important for a variety of reasons. I will give you the hint that it is around the time of the Civil War. And if you're thinking that this is the Emancipation Proclamation, you are absolutely on the money. This was transformational. And here's why. It is the first time in this language from President Lincoln that any president of the United States ever utters the word freedom in the context of a slave. No other president before Lincoln ever said it uh, or had the gumption to do anything about it. So it is the proverbial stake in the ground when it comes to ending the practice of slavery. And he also goes further to empower those slaves to become members of the armed service and to rebel against their owners. You know, symbolically, it's extraordinarily powerful, but I will tell you it was somewhat limited because it was a wartime executive order. Contrary to popular belief, the proclamation could not and did not end slavery because it ended with Lincoln's tenure as president it also only applied to Southern states that were in rebellion against the Union. So Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, uh, Southern states that stayed with the Union were allowed to keep their slaves notwithstanding the Emancipation Proclamation. Nonetheless, I think this was a transformational document for the reasons that I cited. 
it's the first time any U.S. president ever uttered freedom in the context of slavery, and I think it got the ball rolling with respect to African Americans and getting their rights. Event number four. This one is on the heels of the Civil War, and I put them together because they're inextricably intertwined. These are acts of all of the, all of the states in the Union to change fundamentally the lives of African Americans. Here's how. The 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution in 1865 literally made it illegal to have slaves. It said neither sla slavery basically is outlawed in all states within the U.S. jurisdiction. That is a fundamental thing. It takes the proclamation to the next level to make it the law of the land. The 14th Amendment is really an unsung hero in all this. It is the antidote to a case called Dred Scott. Uh, the United States Supreme Court before the Civil War decided in a case called Dred Scott that if you were black in the United States, whether you were free or a slave, you were not entitled to any of the rights of citizenship. That means we don't care how long you've been here. You're not entitled to be a citizen in any way, regardless of your station. We think it's inherently wrong. The 14th Amendment corrects that by saying anyone born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen of the United States. And now the 14th Amendment has been embraced by people of all race, all culture, from all around the world, because they know this is the way you become a citizen of the United States if you have children here. But its root is literally in slavery and uh, the freedom of African Americans. As I mentioned, uh, it was designed, the 14th Amendment was designed to overrule the, the terrible Dred Scott decision that was issued by our U.S. Supreme Court. Number five. This one is really obscure, um, mainly because you wouldn't know about it unless you knew about it. So I'll just tell you, it's all about the NAACP. In 1909, it's, it became the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the United States. Here's the irony. It was founded by white dudes, primarily. How about that? One black man, one black woman, one white woman, but generally speaking, the founders of the NAACP were white males, which reinforces the point. They knew it then, we know it now, we're all in this together. And they wanted to make a fundamental change in America because at the time, a black man was being lynched once a day in this country. Get your head around that. Every single day, a black man was being lynched somewhere in America and the NAACP's founders were tired of it. They were tired of the random violence against African Americans. They formed themselves uh, as a, an organization to help stop that and protect us from that and to ensure greater equality for all persons. The other thing is they spawned the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which is famous because those are the people who did the famous Brown versus Board of Education decision. And without there being NAACP as the platform, it's doubtful that the Legal Defense Fund would ever have been created. All right, this is another obscure one. It's 1948, for those history buffs, I will tell you it's around the time of the Korean War. Okay, I'll tell you, it's, it's Harry Truman, one of my favorite US presidents. Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces. This, I think, is a game changer that most people gloss over. Here's why. There's nothing more fundamental as a pillar in American society than the military itself. Harry Truman, in an executive order, basically changed the game for America and started the fall of the dominoes of discrimination, starting with perhaps the largest and most important institution, which is the armed forces. He was forced to do that because, as usual, the Southern senators, the Southerners have this thing, they just resist change. Here, they didn't want any kind of civil rights legislation he had in mind that would affect the military. He said, okay, that's fine. I'm gonna issue yet another executive order, 9981, to abolish racial discrimination in the United States Armed Forces. I think this is the beginning of equality in America because if you get it right in the military, then the rest of society, I think, will follow. And I think it's borne out by history. And here's a photo of what that looked like. It manifested itself in the Korean War. You have black and white soldiers serving together in foxholes, fighting together, dying together, and Harry Truman's happy about that because he says that's the way it ought to be. 
I've already tipped my hand on this one. This is May 17, 1954. Uh, most people celebrate July 4th as Liberation or um, um, Independence Day. I have this one on my calendar as Independence Day because that is the date that Brown versus Board of Education was handed down by the United States Supreme Court. This case is the absolute game changer for this country. Here's why. It overruled this doctrine of separate but equal, which was a myth that never worked in the first place. It was a silly doctrine. And it basically said everybody's equal in the educational system, but I think they knew it was going to change everything in addition to education. So this one case dramatically changed the legal, social, and political landscape. And quite frankly, it has a lot of irony. If you take a look at this picture, Brown was decided by these nine white old men on my right. Again, going back to the point, they know, they knew we were all in this together and that they were making a fundamental sea change within America by issuing this order and they knew it had to be unanimous. Here's the irony. Earl Warren was a Republican from California appointed by Eisenhower. Hugo Black was a Democrat from Alabama, but an admitted member of the Ku Klux Klan. Without them coming together and making this decision, we would still probably be living in some modified version of apartheid like they had in South, South Africa. This decision, uh, as I said, is the game changer for America, and that's why. After the game changing decision, we now get to Montgomery, Alabama. Yes, you got it. This is Rosa Parks. This is all about Rosa Parks. This is transformational because it is changing the way black people are allowed to use public transportation. And it's done in a dramatic fashion with this almost year long bus boycott. And most people say that Rosa Parks sit in on that bus and refusal to give her seat to the white man who's demanding it is the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. And I can't argue with that. And there you have Rosa taking a mugshot with her number, and she is forever going to be an iconic figure in American history. The other thing that you might find interesting is that boycott was led by a 26-year-old person, and his name was Martin Luther King. I know, extraordinary. Speaking of King, event number nine is in Washington, and I think most of us know what this is going to be. This is I Have a Dream speech. For those of you who are wondering what the mall really looks like when it's full, this is what it looks like. Contrary to what the president has said, this is a full mall. And they all came out in full force to support Martin Luther King and their march on Washington. The I Have a Dream speech is iconic for a variety of reasons, not, notwithstanding the substance of it. I would say it caused most Americans to take a fresh look at the race issue and to look at themselves and decide whether or not they wanted to live in a country like it was and decide, I think, positively to move forward on the race issue. Technically, I think it's one of the two best speeches ever given in U.S. history. It's a tight call between the I Have a Dream speech and the Gettysburg Address. I'm a little more in favor of um, Martin Luther King because he did it on the fly. Gettysburg was prepared by Lincoln and almost read. I Have a Dream was inspired by Mahalia Jackson whispering in Martin Luther King's ear while he's at the podium, tell him about the dream, Mar Martin, tell him about the dream. And he spontaneously gave it to us in a way that I think has changed America. And he was right about this. Freedom doesn't come voluntarily. It has to be demanded. It was true then, it's true now. And that gets us to the last historical event. I don't have to tell you which one this is because I think everybody remembers this. Here's why George Floyd's murder was transformational. I submit to you it's the first time anyone has ever seen a real-time lynching in America on video without question. In my view, the lynching is where you have someone who's a judge, jury, and executioner with no due process bringing about the ultimate result to a human being. There you have it with George Floyd and that officer having his knee on his neck. <clears throat> the other thing that was transformational is listening to those primal screams. I don't think anyone who heard those screams will ever be the same after watching that video. I know I'm not. It rings in my head when I think about it. And I think the beauty, if there is a beauty in this is, this event woke a lot of people. 
there were people who were skeptics about whether or not police brutality was actually going on in the United States. Who said, man, nah, it's probably not that bad. They may rough people up every now and then. No, they got it. And the people who already knew it were catalyzed to do this. <clears throat> part of my silver lining part of this. And my wife told me it's not really a silver lining when you do a comparison of what horrifically happened to Mr. Floyd. But this is the best I can do in terms of characterizing it from my perspective. I was heartened by the fact that people all across this country went to the streets to peacefully protest and exercise their First Amendment right to seek a redress of grievances from their government. They're entitled to do, to do that. And the redress they're trying to get is a change fundamentally of our criminal justice system so that it becomes fairer and more equitable when it comes to people of color. You know, that's the beauty of our system. And I love seeing it. And actually, I was very proud that my law firm, Perkins Cooey, filed a lawsuit against the city of Seattle in order to vindicate the rights of those peaceful protesters to demonstrate their First Amendment rights. The other thing that I think is the silver lining is when you look at the crowds all across the country that went out to protest, they're starkly in contrast to the crowds of the 1960s. It's the same issue though. In the 1960s, they were protesting for equality. They were protesting police brutality. They were or, or protesting systemic discrimination. Same issues now, but when you look at the crowds then, they were 80 to 90% black with specklings of others. But when you look at the crowds in 2020, they were mainly white all over the country, but especially here in Seattle, when Carol and I marched in the West Seattle Black Lives Matter march, we were stunned at the overflow of people, thousands of West Seattleites participated, but I personally was stunned just by how few people of color were actually leading the charge. And I thought that was heartening because it, it shows that we are all thinking that we truly are in this together. And the last silver lining I would say from this is Floyd's, Floyd's life was not in vain. He died as a martyr. He died as an international symbol for the Black Lives Matter movement. And I personally believe that his death will be the catalyst for change in the hearts and minds of Americans all over this country. Now, let's get to this last part. I get asked this question all the time. It's easy to talk about race. We know it's a vexing issue. It's been around forever. What do you suggest we do? Well, I'm making suggestions. I'm not telling anyone how they should live their lives. But if it were me and I were asked the question, I would do what John Lewis says to do. I would try to get in good trouble. I would try to do what it takes to, to make America what it should be and to vindicate the soul of the country. To do that, I think you got to get self-educated. Doing things like this is a great first step. I think it shows leadership to actually participate in a conversation about this issue. But there are other things you can do. It can be as simple as watching movies with your family and friends, like Hidden Figures, which talks about the African-American women who are part of the NASA program, or the Loving movie, which talks about interracial marriage and how it was outlawed before the Supreme Court struck that down and the Loving family going through the litigation related to it or Selma, which talks about the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. All of those are examples of real life history in the United States that can make you more educated about the race issues. The other thing is, for many, many years, good people, all good people, have been trying to be neutral about the issue of race, trying to be neutral about you know, how it plays out. And what we're seeing is it's not really working so well. It's time for us to be more anti-racism, to be more aggressive and more proactive on the question of racism. If we really believe that it's a bad thing, we should do something about it. So when we hear it and we see it, we should speak up about it. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. James, I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't know how to follow up with what you just did. How, just, how do we time? speak now? All right, so uh, thank you so much. Awesome, incredible. Uh, we've got time, I think, for maybe one question. And then I'm wondering if maybe you are able to get on the chat. There's lots of questions, uh, but we've run out of time. So I'm wondering if we might invite you to just go to the chat and answer some of those questions directly. Would that be okay? Yeah, and I should stop sharing. All right, so let me, let me see if I can just squeeze this one in real quick. 
Uh, great remarks in history. At this point in time, this is from your friend Jan Levy, it feels like all the, those gains that we have made are under attack. The, there seem to be more division than ever. Beyond the election in November, what are you seeing in the future of race relations in the U.S.? And unfortunately, you have one minute to answer. I can do this in one minute. I look at my daughter as a prime example of how I think this country is going to be just fine. We're going to move beyond this era. And I think the people in her generation are much more in tune on the race issue. They're much more willing to have those conversations than we were in the past. I would stake my bet on the future of this country. I think we're going to be just fine and we're going to be a much better country in the years to come. Dude, that was like 35 seconds. Well done. Uh, thank you for everything. If you do have the chance, that would be awesome if you could just answer some of those questions. And there's lots of really nice remarks in there about you too. So thank you so much for coming on and speaking with us today. My pleasure. Great seeing you guys. Take care.